my history and my journey as Joseph Matisse and my evolution as an artist is in many ways intertwined with and symbolic of Namibian recent history of the genociders. I was born in Lutherans. I belong to a generation that stems from a great grandchildren of the 1906 German genocide history. Imagine if my mother was born in 1929 and me was born in 1954, it tells it all where my roots painfully originate from. Being a harbour town, the harbour town of Ludwigsburg in the early German colony Southwest Africa was identified as a transnational space, especially from 1908 onwards when a diamond boom around the town attracted many migrant workers from other neighboring colonies on a large scale and from the world as well, and also from the German Reich. While the harbor of Lutherburg served as a, also as a military garrison for the German Reich, tells us all how many Navy sailors, sailors and soldiers were around that place at the same time. Furthermore, I'm a, of a, I'm a generation of offsprings from German, Namibian genocide victims born in a colony that the German lost through the Second World War to the Allied forces and through the uh, Treaty of Versailles. Southwest Africa was given to South Africa and from there on it still means it was kind of colonial oppression that we got. It was not to say it was the, not yet a free, count, a, free, a free country. And such to grow up in such a situation from the early 50s until 1989 and being an artist can tell you from what kind of background I'm coming with no other option to still continue even after our independence to remain uh, to, to keep these remaining thoughts in my mind of a painful past. That's why most of my documentation, not all, but most of them, my uh, essays that I'm sometimes writing and works of art are at times also dedicated to the German genocide as a memory. It's against such a background that my opportunities in artistic development were largely became affected and influenced both by internal and external historical circumstances, thinking about the colonial time and also thinking about internal what's internal and also as a human what's internal in the internal part of an artist itself. And it was such a practice that I tried to, to do that. But then also people may ask me, and many of these things that I'm doing also bring up questions, what has the history of German Namibian genocide had to do with me as a Namibian artist? Maybe some may not know where Namibia is on the, on, on the continent. And that is why I brought this up to show exactly here is Namibia. It's called the Smile of Africa. If you look at it, it's on the west, southern west coast of uh, Africa and that is Namibia. There. It's very clear that anybody can know at least where is it on the world map or on the map of Africa. I think that is here. Follow a work descript, uh, description of the, this particular artwork and other uh, early artwork that also goes with the same thing. But in this particular case, I will talk about this work which I've created, which is a tribute to the genocide victims. It's a lone figure with a hollow silver collar slave here, as you can see here. Where the skeleton is hidden, there's a skeleton, top of the skeleton hidden into it. One see many symbols on it. This, this is a, a pass metal which the, the, the genocide victims used to carry as slaves. And on it is clearly written in 1906, just as a memory, Deutsche Südwest Africa. Also very important is if one look at the skeleton coming back to the skeleton there. Uh, one can see the top part of the skeleton hidden there. It was whatever the German 
people were doing at that time, there was a certain Eugene Fisher. He was influenced by Francis Galton, who lived from 1874 until 1967. So here is dates that can tell you 1967, it means I was a small boy already at that time, living from 1874 until that time, uh, 1967. He was a prominent advocate of eugenics and worked as a director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology in Human Heredity between 1929 and 1942. Uh, it is a such a junction that links between the Kaiser's genocide and Holocaust and the Holocaust of uh, Hitler are sobering. One can say it's one and the same thing. And that's where the thing of reparation comes, comes in. If the Jewish people had been paid out, why not also the Namas and Oshereros? Because it was also genocide in the sense by scratching to people's heads, cutting off people's top part of the head here of the skeleton and looking into the brains of people. Imagine that. It tells us it's one the same thing. And also, if you look at the ambiguous Eugene Fischer, who taught medicine at the University of Berlin to the Nazis, Nazi physicians, his students include Joseph Mengele, who fled to South America after the Second World War for his Holocaust crimes against humanity. All the Herero and uh, Nama youth above seven of each were given a required taken of a so-called pass mark around their neck. This is the pass mark that I was talking about, which is around there. It's separate than it is this one here. Uh, and that pass mark around the neck is a sign of the inferior slave status. It was also on the, this basis that uh, Eugene Fisher's recommendations in 1912 that interracial marriages was prohibited throughout German colonies. The pass mark copper plate date 1906 is deliberately marked here by me as the artist, yes, I told you wrong. The hidden skull also in here, inside here, the hidden skull in, inside there also tells us that more than 3,000 skulls of Herero and Nama uh, were sent to Germany University for experimentation during that time. In some instances, you, a Herero woman and Nama woman were made to boil this head and scratch off the skin with glass, broken glass. Some of the very same women were also used as comfort women by the German soldiers. So it was truly a skull duggery, as I could put it to you. Finally, the barcode, and I'm going now to the barcode here. This barcode here is what you find today in contemporary life. You go over a counter and you buy anything that you buy, it's clicked on, the, on by the, the cashier and you, you pay your price. So that is also symbolically, it comes out also to mark that on here and to tell us more how the revelations becomes more eminent and more important in, in this, uh, which uh, actually the, people, the, the offsprings of the victims, victims feel they could have been very far in, the, in, in life economically if it was not for this raping of this country and using people in their own country as slaves after all the cattle had been robbed and so on. Imagine they had no right to any property. That was it. And also, it was around 2001 that uh, the Osea Kutaku Foundation and descendants uh, decided to seek monetary rep reparations in New York and in the court. This work was also created, never to forget the horrendous first Holocaust of German, holo first Holocaust of German Namibian history. I'm also of the opinion that my artwork should not only evoke empathy, but, how can I say, should also stay in motion to motivate action and change. To the extent where I can say my art provides a rich experience of shame felt by German generations. This work is a curious mixture 
of shame and beauty, as you can see. It's well rendered, but somehow anybody who's from that generation seeing all these cows here and how the skeletons of victims were actually all over the desert in, in, in Namibia today, that's how history has ended. You can actually think, what was in the mind of these people? Didn't they think at one stage even to take these bones and make a bone meal for animals? There are so many hidden in this piece of artwork that I think, I feel, it is very important that work, this work, it goes beyond providing representation of facts and emotions around my genocide artwork as a way of responding to the crime against humanity by which in, by which in nature is another thing that is not easy to discuss. Sometimes a picture tells you everything where its discussions will go around and it can bring arguments up and debates on and can go on, but an artwork speaks and each person can look for itself at it. In short, let me end off to say this work is beyond proof and, and doubt the artistic creation of art. And it's one of those works that can, for history can go on and be always admired. As Combrick, the author of Art and Illusion, a publication has said, if art were only or mainly an expression of a personal vision, then there would have been no history of art without art. I'm also of opinion that my artworks should not only evoke empathy, but should also stir emotions to motivate action and change and acceptance of what happened to us in the past and also for the aggressor of the Holocaust upon our, our forefathers that they should start to see also the point in why this, this, we and our, all our people are so far behind in life because of the misery that they have left upon us. Thank you. This artwork has also uh, featured very prominently in the Black Berlin 2000 Biennale in Berlin. Uh, this is a group of Black Berlins born in Berlin, which is again part of the German history to show how many of the people who were taken even over slaves on that side also still have the offspring living and working in Germany. Die zentralen Themen, nämlich Josef Madisa, der das untere äh, Bild gestaltet hat, äh, mit, der, mit der Kette und dem Torso. Was auffällt, wenn, wenn du mal genauer auf das Bild einzoomst, ist in dem Nacken ist so ein Barcode zu sehen. Also es geht nicht nur um, um äh, Versklavungen in, in Old oder in der Vergangenheit, sondern auch was aktuell durch Kapitalismus äh, Auswirkungen etc. passiert. I'm also of the opinion that no artist can claim to have any access to truth or even any real version of a genocide. But one may agree that artists like me do have a slightly better advantage at my disposal because I do believe that what artists do with their talents and their creative abilities is to lend hand, lend hand to passion, sensuality, sensuality and emotion. Unlike Volber with his pro propaganda art during the, the German times, who have twisted everything in favor of what he wants to, the Germans wanted to achieve. That is why I am convinced that my art production or this particular artwork here uh, can lend a special element of truth to inspire and unify today's offsprings of the genocide victims for a better common cause for them to push for their reparations. And I think, uh, with all due respect, I will show something about Ernst Volbe to show how he was instrumental even in the war with the, uh, of, of, of the German genocide in the early 1900s. This, this artist was a German artist. He was a propaganda German artist. And it's very important that one focus on, on how the artist was also used during the German times. Ernst Vollbeer, 
was a German artist and painter uh, and inventor of the grey field grey which is done. He called himself an artist between hell and heaven with brush and, 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 and palette. He was he left from uh, 1876 uh, until 1960. So one can see that most of these people went right through the First World War and they fought into the, into the Second World War un, under Hitler. So to say that uh, one can cut off only the uh, German genocide up to the un, until the First World War was, war was over, it's, it's, not, it's not true. And that's why I really want to bring this closer to everybody to be aware of that. It's very important to also see, to see how Falberg uh, concluded uh, his idea uh, by saying he watched with horror how the Southwest, in Southwest Africa, how the dark colored heroes were chased by our troops, embraced the dark stems of the cam camel thorns and the yellow hot knots, which is the sun in the Nama people stood still against the sand hills and they could not be identified. That's why he came up with the gray uniform for the Sutsch trooper in, in, in German Southwest Africa so that they can actually also see that they are not so easily targetable by the Heroes and the Nama people.